Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And Passover, Pesach is coming up in a few months. And we are in, of course, Parshat Bo. And thank you, Dave, for your commentary today. That was very insightful. Our Parsha, of course, picks up in chapter 10. We read uh, a few verses later today, but it picks up in 10 with the epic journey of the Exodus. Pressure is mounting on Egypt. We're in the middle of the 10 plagues. We are heading toward the parting of the sea to freedom. So let's talk about freedom today. Uh, This morning, I want to do something I think is interesting. Um, I want to take a a little interlude from our Place in the Sermon on the Mount series that we're in. We just covered a heavy topic last week in Matthew 5 and jump forward to the end of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 and we'll use some verses here to dig into this week's Parsha and to dig into freedom in this week's Parsha. So uh, the verses I'm going to pull from are in Matthew 7, verse 13 through 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And those who enter through it are many. But narrow is the gate and difficult the way that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Challenging words. Here's a question. Did Pharaoh choose the narrow gate or the wide way? Clearly, his was the wide way of destruction, but did he choose? There's a mystery in our Parsha. It came up in our reading today. It comes in in chapter 10. See if you picked up on it. Vayomer Adonai el Moshe, Bo el Paro, Ki ani ach davati et Oh, the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh because I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants so that I may show these my signs in their midst. And so you may tell your son and your grandchildren what I have done in Egypt as well as my signs that I did among them. So you may know that I am the Lord. I am Adonai. It's beautiful. Uh, The plain meaning of the text is that God actually hardens Pharaoh's heart so that we would have a great story to tell our children for generations and generations. And we do have a great story. But for us Jews, telling our own story of freedom requires that we don't turn a blind eye. It requires that we go back and wrestle with Pharaoh again and again and again and wrestle with the text. Doesn't freedom require the freedom of the will? Even Pharaoh's will to choose, say, the narrow gate or the wide way for himself. Is Pharaoh merely a pawn in God's plan, an actor on God's stage for the world's display? The next verse makes things even more unclear. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go. So God hardens Pharaoh's heart, while at the same time he asks Pharaoh, How long will you refuse to humble yourself and to give in? So can both of these be true? Uh, Jewish commentators and philosophers wrestle with this question. Uh, The Jewish commentators of old uh, speak a lot about this idea. So Maimonides highlights Uh, a pattern. In the first five plagues, we see that the Torah is different. Over the first five plagues, Pharaoh hardens his own heart, clearly of his own free will. It's only beginning in plagues six through ten that Torah changes and God begins to uh, be responsible for Pharaoh's hardening. Maimonides muses further that after Pharaoh hardens his own heart five times, he wonders that God had closed the door of repentance, perhaps as a punishment. Other commentators suggest that the word for harden, kavad, is more strengthened. So God merely strengthened Pharaoh's resolve as the intensity of the plagues continue. Pharaoh had already made his choice. Now we had to play the part for the world to see. Elsewhere, Maimonides muses about the importance of free will in Judaism. Without free will, there would be no point to any of the commandments or prohibitions in the Torah. 
if we are predestined to be what we are, regardless of how we respond to God's laws, then why bother give the Torah at all? The great Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant argued, if we are not free to choose, then it would make no sense to say that we ought to choose the path of righteousness. Jumping over to C.S. Lewis, Lewis argues that without free will, we'd be nothing more than marionettes or like toy soldiers in the hand of a cruel child playing a game. Free will is a modern problem. What are the pharaohs of today? Are they the pharaohs of the first five plagues who hardened their own hearts? Or the pharaohs of the last five plagues, merely toy soldiers with a chariot in the epic Exodus drama? Shortly after Charles Darwin published On the Origin of the Species 165 years ago, his cousin Sir Francis Galton drew out its implications. If we have evolved then mental faculties like intelligence must be hereditary, and thus our ability to choose our fate is not free, but depends on our biological inheritance. Galton launched a debate that raged throughout the 20th century over nature versus nurture. We behave the way we do because people have behaved this way in the past. They survived, others did not. Karl Marx argued that fate is determined merely by economic forces. Sigmund Freud argued that we are who we are because of deep unconscious motivators within. More recently, uh, neuroscience tells us how brain chemistry influences our behavior. We know alcohol, antipsychotics, illness, brain injury, lobotomy in the 1930s. These affect a person's personality entirely. So are we really more like Pharaoh after all? Except now we don't even have a guiding hand pulling the puppet strings. Now we're simply lost marionettes moved around by blind, purposeless forces like a toy soldier rolling back and forth in the endless surf on the beach of oblivion. This is a dangerous idea. An idea that will whitewash both the narrow gate to life and the wide path to destruction. Actually, uh, some recent studies show this concept of determinism show that it obscures the narrow gate of life entirely from view while leading us down the wide path without even knowing it. In 2002, two psychologists ran a study. They had two groups. One group was indoctrinated with the idea that free will was an illusion. The other group was neutral. Each group was given various temptations to cheat, lie, and steal. Consistently, the group who had rejected free will chose to give in to the temptations and act immorally over the other group. In another study, they measured groups of day laborers and compared workers' beliefs in free will with their job performance by looking at their supervisor's ratings. Those who believed that they were in control of their own actions showed up on time more often and were more capable. So this is what the report said. Belief in free will was a better predictor of job performance than established measures or self-professed work ethic. Another study found students who believed that science has demonstrated that free will is an illusion were less likely to volunteer their time and less likely to give a homeless person something to eat than were those whose belief in free will was stronger. Even more, studies have linked diminished belief in free will to stress, unhappiness, and a lack of commitment to relationships. Here's a quote from Stephen Cave in an article in The Atlantic. Believing that free will is an illusion has been shown to make people less creative, more likely to conform, less willing to learn from their mistakes, and less grateful toward one another. In every regard, it seems when we embrace determinism, we indulge our darker side. When people stop believing they are free agents, they stop seeing themselves as accountable for their own actions. So philosophers like Saul Schmelansky at the University of Haifa have come up with a new idea. Instead of determinism, it's called illusionism. Society cannot afford for people to internalize the truth about free will. Therefore, it must be confined within the ivory tower. The uninitiated must be kept in the dark so that they will maintain the illusion of free will for the public. 
The irony here is that if there's no free will, then there's no reason for Smilansky's illusion in the first place. The fact that he cares whether good or bad things happen in the world contradicts the entire philosophy. Even more ironically, the determinists criticize him for encouraging people to live a lie. And their critique, of course, requires the free will that they don't believe in. It's a, a glaring contradiction within our culture. Going to Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, he says, Secularists believe that nothing should constrain our freedom to choose to do whatever we want to do or to be whatever we want to be, so long as we do not harm others. Their supreme value is autonomous choice. On the other hand, secularists tell us that human freedom does not exist. Why then should we invoke freedom to choose as a value if it is, according to science, an illusion? If free will does not exist, why be bothered by the addictive nature of video games, he continues, or social media? Why prefer genuine reality to virtual reality? It was Nietzsche who rightly observed that the greater our scientific achievements, the lower our view of the human person. No longer the image of God, we have become mere incarnated algorithms. So in the end, the secularists and the scientists are just as perplexed about free will as the rabbis of old reading about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. And we're still left with Yeshua's words, haunting for some, life-giving for others. Narrow is the gate and difficult the way that leads to life, and those who find it are few. In the mystical Jewish mind, we have two souls. One is called the nefesh haba hamit, the animal soul. Its nature is toward selfish worldly desires and pleasures. The other is called nefesh ha'elohit, the divine soul. In the mystical Jewish tradition, our task is to use the divine soul to master and train our animal soul. The Torah is the training manual. We train our animal nature when we engage and when we study and when we follow God's laws and instructions in the Torah. So mystical Judaism has found a home for free will and harmonized the conflict. Our nature is not free at all. Our nature is a slave to whatever forces pull our animal self. But our mission in the Torah is to use our agency of choice the divine self, to awaken our sleepy animal soul, draw it through the parting sea, if you will, and into the promised land of freedom. The tension between these two souls is the arena where our personal freedom is won or lost. More recent brain science tells us the same thing, but in different terms. Scientists tell us that we have different parts of the brain. The amygdala and the limbic systems are responsible for much of our unconscious behaviors, from reacting to danger or unconscious emotional responses. And then we have a prefrontal cortex where we find our ability to become aware of ourselves and weigh objectively the consequences of our actions in life. And it's here that the conscience speaks, and we choose whether or not to listen. And like the two souls in mystical Judaism, the tension between these different parts of our brain becomes the arena where our personal freedom is won or lost. So if you imagine you were to come over for Shabbat dinner at our house, and you walk in the door, and you smell Reina's chicken and potatoes cooking in the oven. New brain research shows that your brain will have picked up on the smell, made a choice about what emotion you're going to feel, the relaxing breath you'll take, and the smile you'll have on your lips before you are consciously aware that you are smelling roast chicken. So roast chicken happens before roast chicken happens. In some cases, our brain registers a decision up to seven seconds before we're consciously aware of it. Isn't that neat? But just because these decisions and feelings are unconscious at first doesn't mean they're out of your control. Even newer research shows that these unconscious patterns are actually neural pathways which connect different parts of our brain together. These neural pathways develop over time on the behavioral and thinking patterns that we practice and repeat in life over and over again, the routines, the rituals of life. Some of these neural pathways are good, like a smile when you smell Reina's chicken on Shabbat. But others are not good. 
paralyzing anxiety when you encounter a particular set of circumstances, explosive anger that plagues a person's relationships. The more we go to one particular behavior or allow a particular emotion to culture within our brains, the more myelin gets wrapped around this neuro pathway. Myelin is a sheath of protein and fatty substances that forms around nerves in the brain, allowing stronger electrical impulses to move faster and more efficiently through the brain. This is the newer concept of neuroplasticity. If we practice, consciously or unconsciously, negative emotions like anxiety and sadness and anger or bitterness, if we rehearse them in our minds, the currents that create these emotions become stronger and stronger. When we consistently make choices to choose to give in to temptations in life or choose to give in to self-centered ways, these neural pathways become stronger and more effective and more efficient. This is how we become slaves and lose our freedom. And I wonder if this is how Pharaoh hardened his heart at first. And then, perhaps over time, his heart was hardened for him, as it gradually became more and more difficult for him to choose another way. In his lust for power over his own slaves, Pharaoh became one of his own slaves. I wonder if Pharaoh really did have a choice until he gave up the freedom to choose at all. Neuroplasticity is important because it means that there's actually a conscious thinking and decision-making part of ourselves that has the ability to influence our unconscious and automated responses and behaviors. Free will, therefore, is something we do have. But rather than an absolute, free will is something that we must nurture and form. Just as mystical Judaism requires our divine soul to train our animal soul, free will requires conscious effort to mold and to shape and train our deepest selves to awaken from the sleepiness of unconscious life. So back to C.S. Lewis's toy soldiers. He developed this idea further. He confesses that in reality, we really are toy soldiers. But our job, where our agency of free will lies, is to ever so gradually transform from a toy soldier to become a real human being, molded and shaped in the image of God. The toy soldier comes to life within us. Before brain science, Judaism understood this at a very deep level. As soon as Israel is free, we are given the Torah. A life filled with prohibitions and rituals and instructions for how to live in the world. The arena of our own agency is moved even tighter, giving us a thousand opportunities every day to be free. Endless opportunities to ask ourselves, should I do this or should I do that? Should I feel this way or should I feel that? What should I think? What should I value? Who do I want to become? These answers make us who we will become. And in Torah, we're not left out in the dark. We're given a set of values. We're given a set of principles that we must choose to become and to make our own values and our own principles. We're given an identity that we must choose to become our true selves. We have been given a people whom we now must choose to become our people. And then we're given rituals. People who are not free consider God's rituals constraining. But nestled within the Torah is the secret to freedom. Rituals provide the space to practice over and over again the kinds of patterns and habits that turn into routines that shape us into free people. People who have chosen the narrow gate of life rather than the wide path of Pharaoh's sleepiness. New research says that it takes six months to form a new neuro routine. Consider Shabbat. Shabbat has power because it forces us to make difficult conscious decisions to stop the routines that run our daily life. So sundown comes and we're forced to say, enough. Time to sign off from our electronic devices. 
Time to say no to creating and producing and fixing and worrying. Time to change our routines. And perhaps when we say yes, we come face to face with the anxieties that are so often eased by the same gerbil wheels that keep producing them over and over and over. And something can happen inside. Melanin forms over the neural pathways that help us do difficult things and consciously change habits. We exercise the letting go muscles of our brains and we show up together to worship and be with one another and we form new joy pathways that bring greater and greater freedom. Consider prayer. Regular structured prayer requires that we interrupt all kinds of neural pathways and redirect them so that we look back to God instead of our unconscious patterns. We become more free. God is asking us to wake up in the Torah, wake up to who he's making us to be. If you imagine inside your brain you have a river flowing in one direction, free will is the ability to stop that river, redirect a new stream in a different direction. And then the more we practice this, the more skilled we become at creating new streams in every area of life. There's a rabbinic parallel that picks up on Yeshua's teaching. This Talmud goes like this. The world is like the letter He, like this. Because it's wide at the bottom, the currents of life lead us astray. But there's a small opening at the top for those who wish to find their way back to life. Now, why is the world come, the world to come like a tiny yud? Because those who find it are few. Here's where this all comes together. Ultimately, God has given us a right way and a wrong way. And he has given us the ability to crystallize ourselves one way or the other. And enter through the narrow gate of life. The narrow gate is more difficult and few find it. The way of life requires more work. And without that work inside, we simply remain asleep until we are no more. Yeshua is giving us the ultimate choice of free will, the end result of a lifetime of choices that will shape who we will become for eternity, whether we will be with Pharaoh at the bottom of the Red Sea or whether we will be with Moses on the other side of it. The rest of the Sermon on the Mount highlights these many choices that shape our freedom. Continuing on verse 24, we read, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rains, the floods, the winds come, and yet it did not fall. Everyone who hears these words of mine but does not act on them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rains, the flood, and the winds come, and it fell, and great was its fall. Pharaoh chose to build his house on sand. Yeshua tells us the rock is the millions of choices you are confronted with all the time, the trajectory of your heart to seek the kingdom of heaven above all things. And after all is sifted and sorted out in all of the gray areas of which there are many in this world, at the very end, there are two kinds of people those who will wash away into the ocean like it was a sandcastle disappearing into the surf as the tide comes in, and those who act on God's gift of freedom, and they will have a house that lasts forever. Allow me to leave you with just one more thought. Later on in John, Yeshua makes a striking statement about the narrow gate of life. He says, I am the gate. If anyone comes in through me, he will be saved. So more than a sage to tell us the way to the gate, Yeshua is the gate himself. And out of the millions of choices we make that will make us into real human beings, the most critical is the choice to trust him, to follow him, to make his life your own life, because he is the way, the way of eternal life, the way of the kingdom of God, and the way of ultimate freedom.
So Shabbat Shalom, everyone.